podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us on a, on a Monday night. Um, we're excited uh, this evening to have Dr. Adam Yankee with us uh, to share his experience and knowledge uh, regarding the patella. And I know uh, just before I do a little uh, housekeeping and, a, and a bi uh, an intro for Dr. Yankee, uh, if you're anything like me, uh, we are ready for some uh, some live football or some live sports. I know it's not football season, but it's Monday night, so I hope everyone is ready for some patella. Um, with that, I'm going to briefly introduce, I'm sorry, in terms of housekeeping, uh, so as you come in, everyone comes in in listen-only mode, so uh, feel free, free to sit back and relax and, and enjoy the conversation. Uh, I'm Christian with JRF Ortho. I'll be uh, doing the intro here, and then I'll be monitoring over in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, you'll see there's a questions uh, box, a dialogue box. Please feel free uh, to type in any questions that you have throughout the presentation, and I'll monitor those. And where we have a pause, uh, uh, either during the, the talk or toward the end, uh, we'll make sure that uh, Dr. Yankee hears those questions and has a chance to respond to everyone. So uh, again, our guest tonight is Dr. Adam Yankee. He's a sports medicine, uh, sports medicine orthopedic surgeon with an interest in advanced arthroscopy, shoulder replacement, and a special focus on patellofemoral dysfunction and cartilage restoration. Uh, Dr. Yankee earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio and then earned his medical degree from Rush Medical College in Chicago. Dr. Yankee continued on at Rush for his orthopedic surgery re residency, uh, followed by the Sports Medicine Fellowship at Rush. Throughout his orthopedic training, Dr. Yankee completed a PhD in the Department of Biochemistry. Uh, through a collaboration with the Department of Biochemistry, Dr. Yankee continues to perform both basic science and clinical research in an effort to develop benchtop techniques that will translate directly to improve patient care. He has written over 50 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters, along with presenting over 50 abstracts at national and international meetings. Dr. Yankee is a member of numerous professional societies, including the International Cartilage Repair Society, a candidate member of the International Patellofemoral Study Group, and he was selected by the American Orthopedic Association as an emerging leader. So I will turn the screen over with that and uh, again say thank you, Dr. Yankee, for joining us and uh, sharing some of your expertise. Thanks, Christian. I appreciate the introduction and thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, I don't know if it's as exciting as football or as exciting as the last dance. I don't know if people watch that either, um, but I need to find something else to watch now that that's off. <laughs> um, can you see my mouse moving right now on the screen? We can, looks great. Okay, okay, great. So, um, you know, there's certainly a lot that can be covered here, and this is as listed uh, my cartilage algorithm. Uh, certainly, I try to make everything as evidence-based as possible, but it's not always possible, and sometimes we have to follow certain gestalt rules that we come up with through our training uh, or through our personal experience. And so this doesn't mean this is the only way you can do these things. It just happens to be my approach, and it's constantly changing for better or worse. Um, also, the Christian mentioned uh, putting comments. You know, I would really encourage that. I'm going to try to only talk for half an hour if possible here um, and then do some cases at the end. And hopefully, if there's any questions, um, I can help answer those uh, or at least try. So, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll also say that uh, there was a pretty ambitious uh, agenda on the flyer. And so, there's definitely some points there that I'm not going to be able to get to. So, if I miss anything you wanted to hear, again, just let me know. So when we're taking a look at cartilage treatment and focusing specifically on the patella, uh, I'm sorry, I also have quite a bit of uh, what, I what I like what Dr. Farr says. So I'm heavily conflicted in this area and hopefully I'm so conflicted that I don't have any one horse in the game and you can uh, look up my disclosures online. I'd also like to thank uh, Haley Huddleston, who's my research assistant, for the help that she did with the slides as well as a lot of the projects that I'm gonna to present tonight. So as I was mentioning, uh, when it comes to cartilage treatment, we certainly have a lot of different options for treatments. And if anything, that can just make things more confusing. I'm also gonna note that I really will not spend time on products that have just come to the market or are quote unquote below the bar products that don't have any uh, outcomes associated with them. 
beyond a case series. So this is sticking, and that's consistent with my clinical practice as well. I think it's hard to know what to do because if you look at most cartilage outcomes, 85% of them work. And so that's for all outcomes in all locations, theoretically. And I think we all know that that's not true. And it's just trying to figure out what works in which area best. So how can we improve these outcomes? And how can we make uh, patients hopefully have a 95% success if they're gonna go through a one year recovery? This is a little bit esoteric, but I wanna back up a little bit and think about where our surgical intervention lies and what else surrounds it that we can try to improve. So when somebody has a knee injury, they can have just pain associated with it that may have a chemical process like inflammation, or they can have a structural abnormality such as a cartilage defect, a meniscus tear, or an ACL tear. And both of those things are important because a lot of times uh, they don't necessarily correlate, which we'll talk about. Ultimately, no matter what we do, it'd be nice if we could repair the structural damage, have a structurally improved knee, and also improve pain, which is arguably, again, the more important component to that. And then we want that to result in good function for the patient. And the image at the end we'll come back to, but it has to do with collecting information from that along this entire pathway and how can we try to synthesize all this information in a way where we can start to come up with predictive algorithms to say, this is how you're gonna do from the beginning. So when we look at structural damage, uh, one thing that's really important is that we know from many studies, whether it's the rotator cuff, meniscus extrusion, after meniscus transplants, that the correlation of structural disease with clinical symptoms is very poor in many arenas in orthopedics. And so we don't want to say that just because you have a defect on your MRI that it needs to be treated because we certainly know there's many incidental defects. When we look at contributors to pain, there's many things that can contribute to pain that don't show up on imaging. So when people don't have uh, structural abnormalities, but they have pain, their MRIs are normal, they have no bone marrow signal, there's certainly many things that can be abnormal. And Scott Dye's work here where he scoped his own knee while he's awake was really pretty monumental. And you can see that the areas that have dark black are essentially the areas that were the most painful in the fat pad and the meniscal capsular junctions were the areas that actually had the most pain fibers and the most painful area when they were probed. And so we need to know that the cartilage is important, the meniscus, the ligaments, but also the subchondral bone, the synovium itself, the synovial fluid, as well as the patient that this is all residing in. And there are several studies that show that actually the synovial fluid makeup, this, the status of the synovium, as well as the patient's mental health are arguably the strongest predictors of somebody's outcome after surgery for cartilage or uh, pain-related knee arthroscopy procedures. And so there's, those are completely separate talks, but I think it's something important to keep in the back of our minds. When we look at cartilage transplantation, we're asking a lot. So cartilage forms over many years uh, natively and takes arguably throughout all of skeletal immaturity to form native articular hyaline cartilage. And we're trying to do this in six to 12 months in a patient's body while they're moving and being active. And they no longer have the regenerative potential that they used to. And so I think that puts a, a big burden on processes that require the growth of cartilage. We also want to keep an eye on the environment. So when we do these procedures, we usually cause a large hemarthrosis. And we all know that hemarthroses can lead to rapid onset of arthritis in young patients, such as those with sickle cell or bleeding disorders. And so we want to look to see, are there things that we can do like post-operative aspirations, injections of biologics post-operatively to try to make it a more conducive environment, especially when we're trying to grow cartilage. Also, keep in mind that there are really no, certainly no large animal models of successful cartilage restoration with regards to growing cartilage from scratch. So this is a major hurdle, and even in controlled laboratory environments, we still can't get that to happen. Now, do you need to have a structurally perfect knee to have pain removed? We all know that that's not true. But just keep in mind that that may not be where the pain relief is coming from. And finally, a structurally improved knee hopefully will make a patient happy in the future, meaning it'll prevent further degeneration of their knee. And a painless knee is really what makes them happy now. And if we can figure out what factors uh, predict somebody being happy in the future and happy now based on an existing treatment, that's where you can really use machine learning algorithms and predictive analytics. And I'll show a small example of that with different patient reported outcome collection software. So when we look into treatment, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today on non-operative treatment. 
that being said, I spend most of my time doing non-operative treatment for patellar cartilage defects. A lot of this will bleed over into trochlear cartilage defects also. Uh, but for the patellofemoral joint, we work uh, really aggressively on injections, steroid, hyaluronic acid if, if possible. Sometimes that can be hard to get insurance approval for. Uh, bracing to help tracking, anti-inflammatory, sometimes activity modification, and certainly physical therapy. Now, these play a really important role, and as we look uh, at the dynamic control of people's legs, you can see on the left, that's a great single leg squat, putting normal tracking pressure across the patella, whereas on the right, you can see there's significant valgus internal rotation and a Trendelenburg hip drop. That patient on the right needs everything except surgery. The last thing you want to do is take them to the OR. If the patient on the left starts to bend down, they get a lot of crepitus, they said they have pain, and they're like, you know what, I just can't go any further because it hurts too much. Well, that's actually a very reasonable surgical candidate, as long as they can try to do a squat in a reasonable fashion. So we are going to move past non-operative treatment, but I don't, it's not an attempt to minimize it. Once uh, you've done this for at least six weeks, sometimes even 12 weeks at a minimum, it may be a consideration to move forward with surgery. And at that stage, uh, we're going to assume that these patients have a uh, cartilage defect on the imaging. Anterior knee pain that's non-structural in nature is uh, beyond the scope of this talk. Once we get to the stage of thinking about surgery, we have a lot of options. And for better or worse, it can be difficult because we have so many options. As we're thinking about these options, it's really important to know that it's not one size fits all. So this is the exact same outfit on three different individuals. And you can get pretty close, and sometimes pretty close is good enough, but sometimes it's not. And so I think that if you only are familiar with a single technology or you're not familiar with osteotomies, I think you can do yourself and potentially the patients a disservice by not really having all the tools in your toolbox. And you have to understand that that uh, toolbox is continuing to, to expand as new treatments come about. So let's start with just looking at uh, the overall outcomes of patellofemoral cartilage restoration. So this was a systematic review that was done with the help of Bettina Hinkle. And it found essentially that if you take all the data that's out there, that they all lead to good clinical outcomes. And there, there's potentially a higher failure rate of osteochondral allografts in the patellofemoral joint. And I'll touch on that as well. But I think that what's important here is we don't really have enough data for a meta-analysis like this to be powerful enough to probably pick up the differences because it takes uh, a lot more patients and larger multicenter uh, prospective randomized trials that don't exist. We know that we want to try to improve outcomes while not adding significant risk. And we also don't want to burn bridges moving forward, which has become a more uh, significant concern with microfracture. And we'll talk about that also. So I'm going to start by using a case example here to work through some of the treatment options and to take you through the algorithm. And then I'll have some cases at the end to try to illustrate aspects of the algorithm that these cases don't cover. And so if we start with a 39-year-old female, she has right knee pain. It's been about a year of rectal patellar pain. She doesn't have swelling. She really has a hard time taking her knee from flexion to extension. She's had two prior debridements already, and they've used radiofrequency devices in at least one of the two, and that was in the, her arthroscopic images that we had uh, from her records. So that's already not a great sign. I wouldn't recommend using heat on cartilage. Uh, on her exam, she really had a difficult time doing a single leg squat and actively, even in the prone position, bending and straining her knee. Uh, I was the fifth surgeon that she had seen. She traveled from out of state. And to kind of add to the confusion here, uh, she really was very tearful on exam. She just would not let me bend or straighten her knee because uh, she would be afraid that it would pop and cause a significant amount of pain. And with a story of two prior debridements and this much pain, it's a little bit hard to know what to believe here and how far to take this patient. When we look at her imaging, you can see that her patellofemoral joint on x-ray is totally pristine, and so there's no issues there whatsoever. When we take a look, I'm sorry about that. Let's see if I can go back. So when we take a look at the MRI, we can see that there's certainly heterogeneity at the apex of the patella, at the central ridge, on both the AP, I'm sorry, on both the axial and the sagittal view. Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell, but there might be a small uh, uh, fluid signal deep to the cartilage, just superficial to the bone, uh, that may be something of a concern. And so this patient, we had a long discussion. We said, you know what, we'll try another arthroscopy. I'm not ready to move forward with anything more significant than that. 
And this is her examination under anesthesia with a scope in place. You can see that she has these large cartilage fragments that are delaminating and flipping back and forth. And when she engages her uh, quad, it's causing so much force that this is really a kind of a visceral reaction for her and causes, whether it's just anxiety or pain, it's hard to know, but it's certainly a real finding on her arthroscopy. And so this is a patient where, um, first of all, if this was an incidental lesion, we know that these show up very frequently, as mentioned earlier. Don't treat a cartilage defect that we don't think is causing system uh, uh, symptoms for the patient because they certainly show up very frequently. If we think about doing a debridement here, uh, which I would do frequently for a symptomatic defect, we want to use a combination of a shaver as well as a curette. This is a little bit of an older video of mine. I uh, now use larger curettes that are sharper that come from the elbow tray. I find those very helpful, plus they're not used as often, so they stay pretty sharp. But I don't see any downside in doing an aggressive debridement for these patients. We're truly getting rid of damaged, non-functional tissue that's potentially a pain generator. And if they have continued pain down the road, then we can certainly think about treating or filling this defect. But this is a patient that uh, just doing a debridement alone might be beneficial. So about five years ago, we started to take a look at my patients and Dr. Cole's patients and look at uh, when you just do a debridement, and basically the patients we use were patients that we did ACI biopsies on. So these patients have a biopsy and you have to wait at least three months before they, you do their implantation. We found that actually uh, only about half of patients moved on with having implantation after they had a biopsy. And so the question is, why is this the case and what happened? Demographically, these patients were largely patients that had patellar lesions. And the second most common uh, was trochlea. And you can say that this is certainly uh, biased. And so we tended to treat patellar and trochlear lesions more commonly with ACI at that time. And so the lion's share of these patients were in the patellofemoral joint. When you take those patients that did not move on with uh, transplantation and say, why is that the case? It turns out that over half of them had symptomatic relief. Now, this study was done in a retrospective fashion. We didn't have the best follow-up in the world. Uh, so we now have a new prospective study uh, where we collected data moving forward with debridements. And we also included patients that did not just have ACI biopsies. So these are also staging arthroscopies, frostochondral allografts, or potentially uh, uh, ACI. So it's really all comers for cartilage defects. This Kaplan-Meier survival curve is uh, survival for conversion to uh, cartilage transplantation of any type. And you can see that uh, a lot of patients don't move forward with the transplantation. And if they do move forward with one, they do it within the first uh, 30 weeks or so, or even sooner. Uh, when we try to separate this out based on the tibiofemoral or the patellofemoral joint, uh, we don't necessarily see a large difference here, but you might see that the red line drops down a little faster, which is the tibiofemoral joint. So we might see better relief from debridement in the patellofemoral joint than we do in the tibiofemoral joint. When we take a look at this closer, I think one of the more interesting aspects here is this is an example of patient reported outcome for this uh, study. And if we look at this is quality of life as measured through the Coos subscore, the blue bars are patients that had a debridement and never converted postoperatively. And the orange bars are the piece of people that were debrided and eventually moved forward with the cartilage transplantation. If we take a look at the preoperative score, the people that converted and take carry that forward, they essentially never saw an improvement afterwards, not at an early or late time point. When we take patients that had uh, preoperative scores that did well with debridement, first of all, they were better than the patients that had preoperative scores, so they were already doing better prior to surgery. And they also had improvement of their scores as soon as two weeks after surgery, and certainly after six weeks, and that improvement did level off, and certainly they're not normal at that point. But we can start to see trends, again, to try to pick out who's gonna do well and who's not, potentially even before surgery. Same thing here for a pain subscore. There was many PROs that were significantly different between groups, but there was a difference preoperatively that only became larger postoperatively, and these differences uh, are usually in place by the first postoperative visit or even by the visit just after that at six weeks. And so if we can take this information when a patient comes into the door, take the patient report outcomes, the lesion location, size, uh, duration of symptoms, and the other factors that we know play a role, we might be able to start to sort out whether or not a single stage procedure would work for a patient or if a two stage uh, procedure is really beneficial. 
Because if I told you that you had an 80% chance of success with two stage, you're probably going to move forward with the debridement and avoid the transplantation. And if I said that chance is 10 to 20%, we might say, let's just order a graft if possible, depending on the technology that we would want to move forward with. There's also intangibles like this patient, for example, uh, I think if you move forward with the cartilage transplant or an osteotomy as a first operation for this patient uh, that you're performing, even though it's her third operation total, I think you could certainly get yourself into trouble. And so there's some other benefits of the two-stage procedure uh, as well. So this is the patient after their debridement, and this patient clearly had significantly improved outcomes. This surgery was about five years ago now, and I do check in with her, and she continues to do fine. She hasn't had pain since, and she hasn't redeveloped her mechanical symptoms. Um, and so we saved her from having a transplant, in my mind, if we were overly aggressive with a single-stage procedure. We did take a biopsy for an ACI because that's a small focal central defect. That's a surface defect as well. And so I thought that would be an appropriate treatment for her in case we needed that in the future. Um, and so sometimes the staging arthroscopy can also be helpful to figure out what procedure would really be best for them. So sometimes you don't exactly know if an ACI or an osteochondral allograft is helpful. And so for decision-making purposes, Andreas Gamal had a nice paper looking at this. Uh, it really is helpful to do the arthroscopy. And a lot of times we'll change our plan in the OR compared to what we think we would have done based on preoperative imaging alone. So I'd say debridement definitely has a major role in the patellofemoral joint for me. And I think I have to always make an argument why I wouldn't do that first. And there certainly are situations, but we do that very frequently. We move on to microfracture, again, specifically in the patellofemoral joint. This was a nice paper by Sudkamp looking at the outcomes of microfracture in different locations of the knee. And what I'm trying to highlight here is that between pre and post-op at six months, all locations had improvement. When we then look at longer term outcomes going from six to 18 months, the patellofemoral joint had less improvement and specifically the patella more so than the trochlea. What I think is really interesting in their paper is if you look at 18 to 36 months to see who had deterioration, uh, the patella had significant deterioration and uh, so did the trochlea, and the condyle was the only one that did not have that significantly. So while there were improvements from pre-op to 36 months, they did deteriorate later. I also think that it's a little bit difficult uh, to look at microfracture outcomes. There's very few in the patella. The patella is a sesamoid bone. The marrow elements uh, are much less significant in that area, and so I'm sure that it has less potential to fill with uh, fiber cartilage. Ultimately, that is what you'll get is fiber cartilage, and the, it's not given a fair chance in that uh, when's the last time you've heard of somebody doing a patellar microfracture with a TTO? You know, usually we don't add these other larger procedures that have increased um, uh, burden or risk associated with them or complications. And if we did that together, you know, we might see significantly better improvement. Uh, similarly, there's not studies that look at debridement versus microfracture. So the outcomes that they see here for microfracture are very similar to the outcomes that we had with debridement. And we need longer term outcome for our debridement study to see if they also are not long lasted. And finally, uh, I'm not going to get into the details here, uh, but microfracture, the technique does matter. And so doing a drilling of some sort uh, is probably better than an all, or at least there's some theoretical advantages and some basic science data to suggest that as well. Balls that are more narrow and sharp are probably better than ones that are wide uh, to try to, prefer, to preserve the subchondral bone plate. And so again, in my hands, uh, microfraction patella does not play a role. That doesn't mean it's contraindicated. I would just say that I do not uh, perform that procedure in that part of the knee. Let's take another case here to make a different example. So this is a 40-year-old male with left knee pain. It's retropatellar again. It's been going on for several years. Uh, he has some mild medial pain as well, but most of it's retropatellar. He has swelling with activity, no prior surgery. He has symptoms with activities of daily living, but admittedly this patient is more uh, concerned about the pain and crepitus and swelling he gets with CrossFit activities. He's extremely fit and active, um, fairly reasonable individual, but definitely is willing to push the limits more than the average patient that comes into the office. An exam, he does have an effusion, uh, pain with patellofemoral grind. It has crepitus with a single leg squat, but can do it very well and has no signs of rotation or valgus when doing a single leg squat. 
when we take a look at his uh, imaging, we can see here that he has essentially bone-on-bone -bone arthritis in the lateral patellofemoral joint. His medial side seems relatively well preserved. And when we look at his MRI, uh, we can see here that his entire lateral facet of his patella essentially has no cartilage. And you can see the associated fusion here. He also has some lateral patellar tilt, but again, it's hard to know if that's just from there's no air in the tire anymore, and so because there's no cartilage, it's leaning over, or if that's really part of the original pathology, so it's kind of a chicken or the egg question. When we look here at the sagittal, the sagittal is a nice view to get a good idea of the trochlear cartilage. You see full thickness cartilage loss across the trochlea here as well. We also had medial sided pain, and you can see there that he clearly has delaminating cartilage. There's some acute fragments coming off there. He also has subchondral bone marrow signal. And so this patient has a real problem. He's 40 years old. He has uh, what some would say unrealistic expectations. Uh, I treated him non-operatively for a few years with injections, physical therapy. We were able to kind of push him through for a period. And we had a very open discussion about considering a reconstruction that he may eventually need a total knee no matter what I do. The only reason to consider uh, biologic reconstruction is because of his activity level. Him more than others, because the amount of graft that we would have to use could potentially be worse than before surgery. And so these are things that uh, we don't move forward with lightly. And I would say for sure, this is not a standard indication in my practice, but I think it's a good extreme example where I think that uh, personally, an ostrochondral allograft is a reasonable consideration for this patient more so than other technologies. Here's his staging arthroscopy, where again, you can see that his patella has completely ebernated bone laterally. Immediately, it is well-preserved, as well as uh, proximally and distally on the lateral side. This is his lateral trochlea, which has significant grade four changes, more so laterally, but also in the central aspect of his trochlear groove, he also has grade three changes. And I don't believe I have the video here, but he has grade four changes also in the medial femoral condyle. But his menisci are completely pristine, his lateral tibial femoral compartment's pristine. His coronal alignment's normal and his tibial cartilage is normal. And so in this setting, I did perform uh, diagnostic arthroscopy to make sure that he was a candidate for uh, bulk osteochondral allograft transplants and not uh, total knee, for instance. I did not think that he would get a benefit from this uh, debridement, and it turns out that he did not get a benefit. When we look at osteochondral allograft in the patellofemoral joint, which is the consideration for this patient, and it depends on the literature that you look at, but certainly some of the work from Bug B suggested that uh, 30 to 55 percent failure rate, but one of those was out to 15 years. I think that because of some of these reports, as well as others' reports of catastrophic failures in the patellofemoral joint, uh, they were kind of abandoned for a period of time. And I think that uh, they're certainly coming back now and uh, more popular. And I think that there's uh, a few reasons for that. One is I think our technique is different, and one is I think that we understand the indications a little bit better. First of all, when we look at OA graft outcomes, this was a systematic review that Jorge Chala did with us. And this took eight different studies and showed that the 10-year survival rate was almost 80%. And so that's pretty good. So it could drop from 10 to 15 years, as that study showed, but it holds on up to that 10 years. Um, so that's certainly promising. If we start to look closer in the patellofemoral joint, we really should not just think of the OA grafts as all being the same. And we really need to separate out osteochondral allograft shells versus plugs because uh, they're very different in many ways, both in indication and in technique. When we look at an osteochondral allograft shell, it's really a total knee style procedure or a patellofemoral arthroplasty style procedure where we perform a complete patellar cut, a complete trochlear cut and that are flat. And then we put the new grafts on top of that. Here you can see on the x-ray, this is a technique that um, has been described uh, as listed above using headless compression screws coming from top to bottom so that they are not uh, within the joint. Uh, when we start to look at that compared to plugs that are well contained, even if the one on the left, which is a very large plug, uh, versus one in the middle on the right, which is more of a moderate sized plug, the way that these integrate is very different. And so I think that you're just asking more from the shell technique than you are from the plug technique. That doesn't mean that the shell can't work, but there's concerns about integration there uh, just due to the biological burden of how much graft you've put in uh, for that patient. When we then look at uh, the outcomes, uh, we were able to take a look at a comparison of shell uh, techniques versus plug techniques. And 
we certainly found that the overall survival rate was much better uh, for the plug technique than compared to the shell technique. And so we had only about 40% uh, survival at 10 years for the shells, where we had 80% survival, I'm sorry, 100% um, survival at eight years for the plug techniques, which is similar to what Bugbee found, if not slightly uh, higher as well. And so I would just say that again, uh, in this setting, we wanna to try to get these plugs to incorporate as much as possible. I'm gonna briefly mention BMAC here. There's some basic science and clinical data. You know, soaking a plug in BMAC today has mixed results. Uh, we're performing a prospective randomized trial to try to help add to the literature here. I would say there's obviously no downside outside of the cost and donor site morbidity is extremely rare. And so I think this is on a case by case basis and certainly a consideration and revisions and just needs to be described to the patients appropriately. And so again, in my hands and my algorithm, I, I do not use uh, shell graphs. I'm not saying they're not indicated. I'm just saying that it's not part of my clinical treatment. I'll push a plug as large as I can to have peripheral containment. And I'll show an example where you can push it. You do not cover the entire patella with the plug, but there's ways to try to adjust for that. Um, so we'll discuss that a little bit further. So this is uh, this patient. So we did a tibial tubercle osteotomy. It gives you an unprecedented view of the distal end of the femur. Um, I do not usually do this approach, but again, with a bipolar large osteochondral allograft as well as a medial femoral condyle, I think it was very helpful for him. Plus doing an anterior medialization would certainly be beneficial. So we can see his three defects and you can see on the patella, he's got large osteophytes that are coming off proximally as well as laterally. And so this is definitely in the stage of arthritis, but this is a 40-year-old, very active individual that again was willing to accept that this is a large surgery for him. So we ended up doing a snowman graft for his medial femoral condyle. Uh, we resurfaced his, his entire patellar facet with an osteochondral allograft. You can see just proximal and lateral to that graft. Uh, we performed a facetectomy and removed osteophytes there as well uh, to try to decrease any overhang or bony impingement there. And finally, when we look at the trochlea, we use the largest osteochondral allograft, uh, I'm sorry, guide that they have in the uh, Arthrex set and uh, resurfaced his entire trochlea here. Uh, admittedly, if you look uh, certainly on the lateral side of that graft uh, where the native tissue is, there is some exposed bone there still. And this is a setting, this is uh, certainly a setting where if you used a shell graft with an anterior cut, you might cover that entire aspect. Uh, but again, at his age, with the concerns of it potentially not incorporating, I do think that the risk of uh, potential catastrophic failure is lower, although it still exists uh, with this treatment compared to certainly uh, non-operative options. So here's the size of that guide. And relative, I, I'm not gigantic, but I'm 6'2", so my hands are pretty big. And uh, that plug is really, really large. And so it can be very difficult to uh, get the matching for this to be correct. And this is true on both the patella and the trochlea. And so I just wanna take a slight uh, detour here to talk about matching of graphs because it's not a small issue and it can make plugs much more difficult. So this is just uh, 3D scans, uh, optical scans of patella. And you can see how there's so many different aspects with regards to the odd facet, the medial and lateral facet, as well as uh, dysplasia that depending on where your lesion is located, uh, you could have a hard time getting uh, edge matching correct as well as the surface topography uh, to be correct for a given patient. And so I think that's what can make osteochondral allografts of the patella uh, particularly challenging. And uh, sometimes I think is another reason why someone might choose uh, ACI or MACI. And uh, it's certainly a real argument uh, because you wanna get this right if you're gonna do it. This is an example of looking at dysplasia radially coming down a trochlea. We're not gonna get into the trochlea as much, but certainly it's also very difficult to get the matching correct. And it depends on which aspect of the trochlea uh, you're resurfacing. Again, the shell allograft uh, avoids this issue in a lot of ways, because you just have to get the proximal and distal aspects correct. Uh, but we really try to do the same thing here. If you have medial to lateral mismatch, it's probably better tolerated. And, but you really want the transition points, proximal and distal on the patella and the trochlea uh, to be correct. And that's really what we're looking at when we're trying to do this technique. This is a study that we started to do to try to improve the ability uh, to do appropriate matching. This is looking at example patellas here. There's about 12 patellas here. And I think that what's interesting to look at 
is that look at the difference in the nose of the patella, the relative height to width ratio, the thickness of the cartilage, which is represented by red is thicker and green is thinner and blue is very thin. And you can see that there's that central ridge that kind of creates that odd facet that goes horizontally that's separate from the separation of the lateral medial facet proximally. And so it's certainly a complex topographic anatomy. And when the uh, metrics of osteochondral allograft group uh, performed a survey, which is a group of surgeons that perform a lot of osteochondral allografts, um, there's many different ways that they said that they do matching to try to get these graphs all the way from tibial plateau to the width, uh, uh, the height of the cartilage of the patella itself. So there's not great consensus there. And there's definitely an effort to try to improve this matching process because these graphs uh, don't have the best availability. The uh, patellas are uh, not anywhere near as common as femoral condyles. And so we want to try to balance uh, making the matching accurate, but still using the tissue that's available. And so we don't want surgeons to become too picky, but we also want them to be comfortable with this procedure. And so Dana Piasecki did a study looking at the correlation of radiographic parameters uh, with anatomic factors and measurements. And he found that the two that correlated the best were measurements of the patellar angle and articular length on x-ray were the most accurate. And so that might be helpful for getting sizing correct. But the question is, um, what actually matters with regards to surface mismatch and peripheral step off? And we're, trying, we're doing a study to try to answer that question. And so if you look at these two patellas zoomed in, again, you can see the difference of the nose of these patella. These are scaled to have the same height on each patella. And you can see on the one on the left is relatively much wider than the one on the right. Also, the cartilage thickness is significantly different in that central ridge compared to on the left compared to the right. And so this is just one example of how there can be many detailed differences uh, between surface topography a patella that might have the same height. And so while articular length was one of the measurements that Piasecki showed can be consistent, unfortunately, it doesn't really correlate with other measurements as much as we would like. So when we look at bone height or cartilage height, it doesn't correlate with really any of the other aspects of the morphology of the patella. Tibial width is another uh, measurement that's used commonly, and that most consistently correlated with uh, the width of the patella bone, as well as the width of the cartilage of the patella, uh, which I think is uh, significantly important, and really both of them play a, a big role. When we look at the cartilage width, uh, that obviously correlates very well with the bone width, uh, which would be expected, whereas that's not the case with height. So this is a, a mod computer modeling study that took many uh, patellas and took a donor, uh, a recipient site, I'm sorry, um, that is either based off of the lateral edge of the patella that's directly distal uh, that abuts the articular surface distally or is off of the medial edge of the patella. We then started to look at different combinations and look at the cartilage and then subchondral bone resultant mismatch as well as a peripheral step off. And then we try to see what factors could help predict better cartilage matching, better bone matching and better peripheral step off. And we'll focus on uh, cartilage matching and peripheral step off as these arguably are more clinically relevant. And the one that showed up for all of these is cartilage width. So cartilage width was had one of the best predictors of minimizing step off as well as uh, overall surface topography and matching. At, like we showed earlier, cartilage width correlates with uh, patellar width as well as tibial width. And so that may mean that tibial width is reasonable in general. But we'll show some examples where uh, ultimately it's important to make sure that you don't undersize uh, and you can certainly be larger, but you have to be careful once you get smaller than your uh, recipient. And so these are some general rules to try to follow this, uh, uh, to try to work through as you're sizing for a patella or a trochlea, because they both have uh, a similar type of shape with the central groove or the central ridge. And the first three are definitely the most important in my mind. So if your lesion is contained within facets, meaning it's only on the lateral facet or only on the medial facet, does not cross the midline, you essentially want a facet of your donor that's at least as big as your recipient facet. And so I'll use that MRI measurement. I don't care how dysplastic that they are, how big their width is, you have to get the cartilage height correct. But as long as the facet that you're getting is at least, is at least as wide and as tall, so I could have a donor that has a lateral uh, Weiberg 1 patella with no dysplasia. And so it's a smaller lateral facet. 
and they give me, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the recipient. And if they give me a donor that has um, significantly dysplastic patella, it doesn't matter, I'll just have extra lateral facet. But if my recipient was a medial side and they gave me a significantly dysplastic patella, that could be a problem. If it crosses the midline, but does not involve the entirety of the joint, then you essentially have the hardest time matching uh, because you really want to try to get the dysplasia category to be as close as possible. So whether it's Weiberg or Dejour, and then you also need to have uh, something that is at least as tall and wide. And so it cannot be smaller than the recipient in height or width. So this is the one that I'm the most particular about. And I think on the patella here, you have a little bit more wiggle room for central distal lesions, but in the trochlea, this can be really difficult. And a lot of times you're trimming off the cartilage on the medial or lateral junction. And again, you wanna get the proximal distal part uh, as close as possible. When you have a pan trochlear or a pan uh, patellar defect, you really just wanna base this off of the height and the width. And I'll tell you that height is king in this setting because all patellas are wider than they are tall. And you do not want a graft uh, that's too tall uh, because these are circular uh, systems that we use for these transplantations. And so you're always gonna have something that's not covered neither there or laterally, which is something I was mentioning earlier compared to shell grafts. Uh, when you have bipolar or extensive grafts, again, none of the dysplasia matching matters as much because you're going to create a new uh, patella and groove, certainly with the shell grafts. So that's a, a brief diversion uh, for patellar matching. I'm only going to talk uh, briefly about soft tissue balancing, uh, only to say that it's extremely important. If someone has chronic lateral maltracking and you have lesions that you're treating uh, with cartilage transplant and an anterior medialization, if you don't loosen up the reins, so to speak, and allow the patella to track more medially by doing a lateral lengthening, uh, you're potentially doing a lot of that uh, effort for no benefit. And so you really want to make sure that you're aggressive uh, with allowing this to loosen as much as is necessary. And then I usually refixate it after, at the end <coughs> after the TTO is complete and I have the knee potentially in 30 degrees of flexion or even in full extension, uh, but you do not want to over tighten this. And a lot of times it's about a centimeter on average of a soft tissue uh, lengthening or lateral lengthening. So I'd say that definitely plays a significant role in uh, patellofemoral cartilage lesions and is done a lot of times as part of my approach as I typically do a lateral arthrotomy uh, for a lot of reasons. One is that, the other is that the vastus lateralis is much more proximal than the BMO. And so you don't have to get into muscle with that approach. We're going to save the TTO conversation. I just want to show, uh, this is not the same patient I just presented, but she had a very similar problem. That is her preoperative uh, image on the left. And after a, a large uh, patellar osteochondral allograft, lateral lengthening, and a tibial tubercle osteotomy, you can see how you can completely change their tracking and bring them much more centrally and really improve their radiographs significantly, and you can have long-lasting results. Finally, as far as cartilage transplants, uh, we certainly need to talk about Macy. It's the other big contender in the patellofemoral compartment. While this isn't a full formal case example, uh, I'll do a couple of these at the end. You can see, though, essentially that this is really healthy cartilage. This is a focal defect. It's a surface lesion only, and it does not involve the bone, and it's a primary procedure. In this setting, I think you're giving Macy the best option, uh, the best chance possible for it to do well and to grow in and to uh, fill that defect as opposed to one that might be uncontained. Now, what you can do, but it needs to be uh, largely contained in my mind. And so if it's got less than 30%, or I'm sorry, less than 70% containment, then I would uh, start to have concerns. That's not evidence-based. Again, that's just a gestalt. When we look at the outcomes specifically in the patella, uh, Andreas Kamal put together a nice study that showed that, again, it's over 80% successful in four years. Again, if you look at those outcomes relative to um, modern osteochondral allograft outcomes, I would just say that they look very similar and it's difficult to know what works. I think the take home for sure is that Macy is a great option in the patella. And I'll talk about some of the benefits and risks between OA grafts and Macy. But I think that's one of my uh, workhorses between that and osteochondral allografts. We did do a study uh, trying to pair outcomes of Macy and osteochondral allografts. Uh, we don't have as many of these patients that have as far follow-up of the osteochondral allografts in the patella, 
Uh, but when we did match for isolated treatments to the patella with 18 in the uh, Ashkandra allograft groups and 45 in the uh, ACI group, we found that there was no significant difference in survivorship or uh, patient reported outcomes between these two groups. And so I think this just means that we still need to further understand where each of these could be beneficial. And I don't think it, I don't think we have the answer yet. I think that you just need to be comfortable uh, with both of them. And again, Macy is technically much easier, especially with the third generation technique. Uh, but Ashkandra allografts uh, certainly are necessary depending on the situation. I'm going to finish by going over uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy, and then we'll summarize the algorithm and then go through some rapid fire cases, and then cover any questions that you have. So the tibial tubercle osteotomies of kind of yesteryear uh, had certainly issues. The Hauser or any posterior medialization of the tibial tubercle that was done for instability increased the loads in the patellofemoral joint and led to patellofemoral arthritis. Now, that has since gone by the wayside. The McKay osteotomy was an aggressive anteriorization that usually had wound dehiscence issues uh, because it was just not a bad procedure. It was just uh, overdone as far as the extent of the anteriorization. And so modern day anteriorizations are very similar to the McKay, uh, just a slightly different uh, technique. When we try to look for guidance of who to perform a TTO on, it's very difficult. And uh, this work by Fulkerson uh, really is obviously one of the most important ones. There's some more contemporary literature now, uh, but this tried to separate out lesions based on their location, as well as their chance of success with the tibial tubercle osteotomy. And as you might expect, a distal or a, a lateral lesion does better with an anterior medialization than a medial or pan patellar lesion. And so that's what a lot of us have based our clinical treatment algorithm on. This is a nice summary uh, by Seth Sherman, taking a look at uh, different techniques showing that an anterior medialization can help with those defects that were just discussed, whereas pan patellar or medial lesions may benefit from a straight anteriorization or at least a higher, uh, higher degree cut um, as opposed to a shallow 30 degree cut. You may do a 45 or 60 degree cut. But certainly I do think there's a role for a 90 degree straight anteriorization still, and we'll talk about that also. When we look at this, this is trying to show um, a measurement of a TTTG on MRI and then what it represents in like a three-dimensional image on a CT scan. So you see that we have the trochlea drawn behind the patella. We show the center of the trochlear groove relative to the tibial tubercle. If we draw the lines on the, the bone model, uh, we can see that the line through the trochlear groove and the tibial tubercle are what create the TTTG distance. But whether we're using this for patients with chronic lateral patellar maltracking or patellar instability, this is a well-known measurable uh, quantity that we know increases the risk for patellar instability. And when we perform an osteotomy and we make these cuts, we're doing measured cuts and corrections based on what we believe is evidence and preoperative imaging uh, measurements and trying to dial this in to say, this patient really needs it and could benefit from it, and this one does not and we try to uh, not expose people to extra risk by just doing this for everybody. When we think about uh, anteriorization, we don't have that same information. And so this is looking at a lateral radio uh, CT scan. We know that we make a cut just proximal to the enthesis of the patellar tendon, and then we make a tapered cut distally, and then typically we use this to then create a plane where we can shift the, the tibial tubercle directly anterior. Most studies will show that one centimeter is the, uh, has the best uh, chance of giving you significant clinical benefit while also decreasing your uh, risk uh, with regards to wound to complicate uh, dehiscence or complications. But the problem is we don't have a measurement to take a look at who really needs this beforehand, just like we do for a high tibial osteotomy or a distal femoral osteotomy. And so right now I would say that we're in an era of over uh, osteotomizing patients. And I think that the osteotomy is one of the most powerful parts of the procedure and should not be uh, minimized, but it would be nice to know really who needs it and who does not. We tried to work with Drew Lansdowne on coming up with a measurement that might help predict this. And we did find that in our study at least, which is uh, slightly different than what some other people have found, but no one else has looked at this specific factor, that's something called the sagittal uh, TTTG, which is essentially the same measurement, but done in the uh, adjacent plane or orthogonal to the regular TTTG. 
shows that a more posteriorized tibial tubercle relative to the trochlear groove increases your risk of having patellofemoral cartilage damage. And we took patients that were having menisectomy uh, without patellofemoral cartilage disease or uh, patients that were having cartilage transplants. And we showed that the patients having transplants had a significantly more posterior uh, tibial tubercle compared to the groove, uh, compared to those without uh, damage. So we're continuing to try to evaluate this and see if this is really a valid measurement to help guide who might need a TTO and who does not. This is a nice study uh, by Flanagan and Josh Harris that <clears throat> looked at the outcomes of ACI with and without TTO, and they at least clearly show that the outcomes are significantly improved with a TTO compared to without. I think it's a valid question as whether or not you see the same benefit with an osteochondral allograft that has a different structural uh, integrity at time zero then maybe there's a chance we can do less TTOs with OA grafts, but again, I don't think we have those answers. But certainly, again, a TTO plays a significant role when treating the patella and cartilage disease uh, in that compartment. And so to try to wrap it up now, uh, my algorithm uh, almost always starts with debridement. I, I rarely have, perform a microfracture or a shell-based graft. I think those are extremely rare situations and they're certainly not part of my clinical practice. Uh, but they may exist. With regards to debridement, I pretty much will always start with that, either to try to get improved patient outcomes or to figure out what would be the next best step for that patient and potentially perform a biopsy, which is, requires the debridement step. This also, again, uh, can be helpful and maybe with uh, predictive analytics, we'll be able to figure out how to choose who really needs the debridement and who doesn't, and we're moving in that direction, but we don't quite have that information yet. Once we do that debridement, Macy and osteochondral allografts are the main two workhorses uh, for me in the patella. And soft tissue balancing and TTO are indicated as needed, um, as discussed. And typically, I'll perform the arthrotomy first, see where the defects are located. And I tell the patient preoperatively that I may perform a tibial tubercle osteotomy. And I decide on my angle and severity of correction based on what I see in the operating room, as well as based off preoperative measurements because if they have a normal TTTG, I wanna be very careful that I don't over-medialize them, as I have seen patients that had iatrogenic medial maltracking or reverse J sign from an over-aggressive TTO. When we're trying to decide between osteochondral allografts and Macy, it's still very difficult. Uh, in my mind, if it's a revision setting, uh, large bipolar or uncontained defects, pan patellar defects, uh, that means proximal to distal and medial to, to lateral, uh, bony irregularity, I think OA grafts do great. If it's a young surface-based uh, lesion that's well-contained, and I think that it's a good candidate for a TTO, then I think Macy can do extremely well for patients, and I use that primarily in that setting. The biggest downsides of these are that, again, the OA grafts can be technically difficult. You have a higher likelihood of a catastrophic failure uh, if the graft doesn't incorporate. Uh, luckily, the worst case scenario is that it just delaminates, and if you're treating a grade four defect, Hopefully they just end up back to where they were and not worse off than that, but it is possible. Macy is extremely expensive. It requires two stages, which again, we said can sometimes be a good thing, but we don't always know that. And then finally, a TTO is certainly not benign. You can have non-unions, fractures, and also requires a longer period of weight bearing because patellofemoral cartilage treatments can weight bear in full extension with a brace uh, in my practice. I didn't get into the details of patellofemoral arthroplasty, but it's certainly good for patients that are older, are looking for improvement with daily life symptoms alone, they're not interested in impact activities, and they kind of, kind of want the one and done uh, type technique, so to speak. So hopefully it's a little bit less confusing. It's still a very confusing space. There's many new t uh, products to the market that don't have evidence behind them. Again, I'm only an early adopter in the setting of clinical trials, and I haven't had an appetite to use them otherwise. Uh, I'm going to use the last minute here to just quickly run through these. So here's a 50-year-old patient, no arthritis on x-ray, very large patellar cartilage defect, grade four, uh, where you can see there, and the rest of it's grade three. This trochlea is completely normal. In my mind, I can't do a patellofemoral arthroplasty on this patient. We try to get a, a patella that fits his uh, level of dysplasia, which is minimal, and matches the height and width, and we fill the center of it as much as possible, perform a straight anteriorization to offload that as much as possible, and then perform a microfracture of the remaining aspect just to help with a little peripheral fill there, 
uh, if he had more arthritis in that aspect, then we might perform a facetectomy, but he did not have that. This is the patient's post-operative x-rays. You can see the fit. This is his post-operative visit at two weeks after surgery, and he's now about two and a half years out and continues to do very well. Here's a 30-year-old female, central defect that crosses the midline, does not extend proximal to distal. It's oblong in nature or irregular, uh, and it's a surface-based lesion only. Her trochlea is totally normal. Again, in my mind, this is a great straight anteriorization as well as an ACI for this patient, and uh, she did very well. This is a 49-year-old female, much more difficult situation. X-rays are relatively well-preserved, clearly is developing arthritis, no medial lateral tibial femoral disease. She's a uh, personal trainer. She runs frequently. She has symptoms of daily life as well as higher-level plyometric activities. Long discussion with this patient on a PFJ versus biologic resurfacing. Uh, she was open to the idea of biologic resurfacing. She's now two years out, still is doing well, uh, has no pain with ADLs, and is performing significantly more impact activities than she did prior to surgery. Obviously, the question is here is not when do the grafts fail, but when does the rest of her knee become arthritic, because uh, eventually that will happen. And that's probably why these do fail eventually at 10 years. Uh, we have two more left, I think. This is a 16-year-old. You see that line down the center, that's a prior ORIF that this girl had. She actually had a non-union and two revisions, unfortunately. Uh, she then came to me with retropatellar knee pain. We took out her hardware, uh, waited for the bone to heal, and then performed a bulk uh, osteochondral allograft in a 16-year-old. Again, not a typical uh, procedure for me, but in her, this did very well for this specific indication. Last one is an 18-year-old female. She has patellar instability, significant Alta with a canton de Champ ratio of 1.8, and she has pain even outside of instability episodes. Very straightforward individual uh, and a good historian. And so for her, we did do a Macy with a distalization and an anteriorization with an MPFL reconstruction, and she eventually did very well afterwards. Um, but those are just to try to help solidify that algorithm a little bit. Um, I hope this was helpful and didn't just add to the confusion. Uh, and thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yankee. You an amazing amount of information. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate as well a very a, a very balanced uh, discussion, specifically of of matching and some of the difficulties that we may see on the tissue banking side and trying to fulfill the mission, trying to make sure that the uh, the graphs are utilized. And as you said, uh, with Patelli, in some cases, we do have uh, even additional challenges uh, with availability. Uh, so thank you for bringing some of those things up. We do have a handful of questions. Maybe we can go through them in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, in terms of matching then, is the, big, is the biggest takeaway or the key takeaway from a surgeon perspective, maybe conveying a little bit more inf of that information about what type of lesion and what type of of um, grafting you'd ultimately like to be able to do so the tissue bank can be looking for the ap appropriate graft. Yeah, uh, I think that's really important. <clears throat> and I, I will change what I tell uh, the tissue bank in this setting um, based on the lesion that I have. And so those four criteria I was going through are really what I base that on. I think that if you do tibial width, you can get it pretty close a lot of the times. Uh, but as you're starting off early in practice, yeah, you really want these procedures to go as smooth as possible. Sure. And so using those guidelines of checking dysplasia, if it's a central lesion but doesn't extend to the periphery, um, looking at the facet width, if it only involves the facet, uh, really can be important. And again, that's another benefit of the staging arthroscopy is you can really see what's grade three and how far will this extend because uh, they're always bigger than they appeared on MRI. Sure. And actually, from a tissue banking standpoint, that is potential upside as well uh, in that if we saw, uh, you know, some sort of lesion or degradation in a certain contained area of a patella, let's say, you know, a facet that ap appears to be pristine cartilage, potentially that still works. Historically, that may not have been uh, put up for transplant, but if we can match that with the appropriate patient, uh, for the appropriate case that might allow us to use that graft as well. Um, from a, I know with osteochondral allografts in general, uh, the depth of the plug uh, has been has has gotten a lot of attention, a lot of discussion. The mo uh, the trend has probably been to uh, thinner plugs ultimately. Although Dr. Gamal recently had a nice study where too thin potentially brings in some some questions as well. In the patella where you see thicker cartilage to begin with, what's kind of the go-to depth? 
Yeah, you, you essentially don't have a choice in the patella or in the trochlea uh, because you have to contain uh, the medial or lateral extent of a patellar defect. And in a trochlea, you have to contain the proximal distal extent. And that mismatch will end up being more significant than whatever people are going to talk about in the femoral condyle. And so I would say that you should try to have on the most narrow aspects as little as possible. So uh, usually something like four millimeters, six millimeters is the largest. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the central aspect is going to be significantly greater and have more bone, but there's not much that you can do about that unless it's a pure lateral facet defect that doesn't cross the ridge, then you don't run into that issue. Sure. Same thing on the trochlea. If you get a couple millimeters of graft on the proximal distal aspect, you can easily end up with 14 millimeter thickness on the side, depending on how big the graft is and what the level of dysplasia is. And so you just have to understand that the, the same rules don't necessarily apply. And I don't think that you should, you know, quote unquote, freak out in the OR if you're not able to keep a six millimeter plug in that setting. Perfect. Um, specific to the patella then, any other surgical tips and pearls, uh, stabilizing the patella, I guess maybe specifically with something uh, like an osteochondrolograph, stabilizing the patella, uh, any additional fixation uh, or in, in any scenarios, um, what do you do to handle that dense bone? Is it is tamping, things like that, anything that might help? Sure, uh, on the patella, I, if it doesn't cross the central ridge, then it's kind of a non-issue because it's flat on flat, and so it's pretty easy to match in that setting. Uh, if it starts to go into the odd facet or crosses the central ridge, then that certainly can make it much more difficult. And I will try to uh, balance the guide. Uh, I do it by hand or freehand, and I'll take a marker around the tip of the guide or the amber cylinder. I'll place that on for kind of a dental imprint type appearance so I can see where it makes contact. And I'll do that on the donor and the recipient, and I'll try to match that. It's also important to know that if the graft is a little bit uncontained as far as there being more of a defect laterally, that you may have it be proud laterally, but that's okay because it's not, you're not matching the adjacent exposed bone, and so it may sit proud in that setting. But I think really looking at it in an axial view or kind of looking down the gun sight and checking to see where you are, uh, how you're angling in that position and allowing it to sit along the central ridge is what can make that part um, quite a bit easier. Same thing on the trochlea is that you can have it sit on the medial lateral extent and you want to check your distance from uh, the cylindrical guide to the proximal aspect of the, of the groove and the distal aspect. And the easiest thing is just to make those the same with a ruler and then you place your guide pin based on that and do the same thing uh, with the recipient. As far as, I'm sorry, with the donor. <clears throat> as far as uh, accessory fixation, uh, because of the hard bone in the patella, I haven't found supplemental fixation to be necessary. Uh, for the patella. I will say that really getting a really good dilation uh, is important depending on the system that you utilize as some of them have significantly greater uh, mismatch. And so when you get to a millimeter of mismatch, um, okay. they're much, much harder to get in and we really do not want to be impacting these. And so I'll taper the end of the graft slightly and start to bevel it so that I can easily get it in. At the same token, I don't want it to easily come in and out. Usually once I get it in, um, it's not coming out or it's at least very difficult to get it out in the patella because of how tight it is. And I would rather there be um, the ability to over recess it a little bit than have it be proud. And so I'll, this is definitely a measure, measure twice, um, cut once scenario. Perfect. Uh, two more quick questions, if we can take just a minute. I appreciate your time. Um, do you have any experience or any thoughts on uh, cryopreserved um, allograft cartilage sheets uh, for, for patella or trochlea defects? I think that they definitely have uh, some benefits of putting in what has a structurally, quote unquote, normal hyaline cartilage, or at least a type 1, type 2 collagen. Uh, structure that Highland cartilage would have. You know, they don't come in different thicknesses, and so that certainly is one of the problems, but they do uh, conform very well. I think Aaron Critch just had a two-year outcome study looking at that and showed that it was uh, fairly promising. Um, I think the best thing I can say is they play a role. Uh, they may play a role uh, where you would otherwise use Macy and certainly could be a cheaper counterpart part that could be done in a single stage. Uh, but we just need to start to develop evidence to see where that, that can really help. And I think that the trochlea 
is probably uh, one of the most attractive places to use it for a central lesion that crosses the midline. Sure, sure. Uh, and then final question. Um, we're fortunate tonight to have a little bit of a mix of, uh, in terms of attendees, some folks that are involved on the tissue banking side, uh, some Arthrex partners, uh, and, and some surgeons as well. Um, from a standpoint of, of working together as a team, the logistics are, can be very, very difficult around osteochondral allograft. So any, um, I guess back to tips and tricks, but any advice about working with your clinical team, your industry partners, uh, the tissue providers to, to try to, you know, make that, those logistics and that, that process as smooth as, as possible? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a few different aspects. One is one that we haven't really touched on at all, and that's the insurance component. Uh, that's a major issue. And there are some surgeons that use certain technologies in their practice because it's the only one that gets approved for them. And so it can really guide treatment significantly. And so uh, I would say that my practice is an example of where the two, pro the two uh, transplants that I discussed are uh, usually typically covered, and I don't have too much of an issue with those whereas cryopreserved sheets or uh, minced cartilage would not be covered. And so that definitely has an effect uh, decreasing my appetite to use those types of uh, products. But I think that um, certainly JRF and others will work with you to help you understand the process of submitting for reimbursement to get prior authorization and to get your graft covered uh, before you move forward with the procedure. And every insurance has its specific nuances and usually uh, the companies can help you navigate that. I think it's also important to stay up to date on the literature to understand what matching really matters for sizing because uh, you don't want to be overly picky for OA graphs because you may never get one uh, because they uh, are, uh, you know, um, donated tissue from usually traumatic incidents. And so uh, it's very difficult to predict their availability. Right. And so understanding uh, that you can use usually a wider graft than your uh, recipient the lateral for medial issue and, and the femoral condyle, depending on the size of the defect and the issues we just discussed in the patella and what we'll try to shed some light on in the trochlea eventually. Um, I think understanding that it doesn't have to be perfect is important. And then uh, last aspect would be getting used to being involved in the sizing process, certainly early on and understanding how the measurements are being taken and, and uh, how you might take your measurements and how they're measuring uh, for you if you're sending images. And I guess one final point is that uh, it's sometimes it's nice to take a visit out to the graph procurement company that you're using and really understand what their process looks like. And I think it's pretty helpful. That's a great point. Great point. Um, and, and with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap up for the evening, but I wanted to take just a moment again and say thank you, Dr. Yankee. Really uh, tremendous having you as a guest. That was uh, an incredible amount of information and a, in a relatively short time. And uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy life to, to share that with us. Well, I'm sorry it wasn't the half hour I promised, but hopefully it was still helpful. Oh, it was, it was beautiful. Yeah, so much information. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Take right, care, everyone. We'll go ahead and, uh, and close the, the webinar down. Have a, have a good evening and uh, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you.